All right, Laura, thanks very much. And good afternoon. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'm joined again today by Bob Yeager, who is uh, district, chief district engineer here in Northern Kentucky, our district six. And um, I also want right out of the gate, I want to acknowledge Governor Andy Bashir. Uh, Governor Bashir's leadership came from the very beginning. And he said to me, he said, Jim, I want you to get the job done, but I want you to get it done safely. And that's exactly what we've done. I said from the beginning, no cutting corners on this project. And we have had remarkable, remarkable uh, talent assembled for this project. The governor also said to the public when we were talking about the, uh, when the event just occurred, he said, now I want everyone to know that I will not ask anyone to drive across this bridge until I am sure that I would drive across it myself with my own family. And so those were clear instructions from our governor and we appreciate that. We appreciate his leadership. Now, where are we today? We will be going from active construction to the completion of the project within just a short period of time. In fact, we announced that the project would be reopened uh, to the public uh, the bridge would be reopened to the public on December the 23rd. That's 14 days away. Now, I've been in the construction industry a long time myself, and I know better than to declare victory prematurely. But I can tell you that things are going well on the project, and things are going according to schedule. Now, we've been fortunate, too, that we've had good weather. But our plan includes challenges that the weather might present to us. We've been fortunate, however, and the weather has accommodated our schedule really well. So where are we? The contractor, Kokosin, there's a really clearly and noticeable work that's been achieved. You no longer see the opening on the bridge at the second, at the upper deck. So that opening where the fire actually was the most intense where we had to remove the steel beams that had been compromised and damaged through the fire. We had to remove those steel beams. We had to remove the upper deck at that location. About 7,000 square feet of the upper deck had to be removed. That's been done. And that opening has now been replaced with both the steel beams, the support beams, and with the metal deck that will receive the concrete and the driving surface on top of it. And these images actually illustrate that. So this, uh, this image, this picture shows the metal debt, shows the construction work underway in the area where the, where the concrete was removed and the new beams were installed, okay? Now, last week and actually through the weekend, there was quite a bit of labor intensive handwork to get ready for the new concrete. For example, the lower deck barrier wall was jackhammered, was jackhammered away. Its removal was done in a precision, in actually what's called precision demolition. And that was in order to prevent any damage to the structural steel members on the bridge. Uh, this week, the work continues, of course. On Monday, new bars, uh, this is the reinforcing steel. It's called rebars for short, uh, shorthand. Reinforcing steel was placed, was installed. Uh, this, reinforcing, this reinforces the concrete driving surface. Uh, and there are actually two layers, two layments of steel reinforcing bars. Each of these cross sections was actually tied by hand. So you can, you can understand that there was, and this image actually shows the, um, the uh, Kokosing employees actually tying the reinforcing the rebars on the deck. So today the first concrete is being poured to create new barrier walls on the lower deck, the lower level of the bridge. 
The weather forecast is favorable, has been favorable all day, and that work is underway as we speak, in fact. Tomorrow, concrete will be poured to create the new driving surface on the upper level of the bridge. That's a roughly 7,000 square feet. I'm told it's about 220 yards of concrete. That's a, maybe too much detail, too much in the weeds, but it's actually to illustrate that there is significant amount of work that's occurring that has been prepared for, for literally, literally now several weeks. And you will see then the, the finishing efforts, especially for the upper deck. Now it will take several days for the concrete to do what's called curing. And that's a hardening of that concrete. And after that, then the deck will be ready. Now, all of this is being inspected. All of this work is being inspected. There are several inspectors, literally anytime the contractor is working, we have inspectors from the transportation cabinet on site. Next week, the lower deck surface will actually be placed. And that's where we have milled the surface. That lower deck did not require full replacement because the intensity of the fire, of course, did not impact it like it did like it did the upper deck. And actually the upper deck still was where the most compromise occurred. The lower deck concrete surface will be milled, scarified, and <clears throat> about two or three, two to three inches will be replaced with a, another, with a uh, concrete surface. Okay, now let's turn to the maintenance, uh, traffic maintenance. We are planning now for the reopening of the bridge and restoration of normal traffic. And again, that date is December 23rd. That's the scheduled reopening. There's a lot of work to be done, of course, in restoring our traffic patterns. It has to be carefully and thoroughly and thoughtfully coordinated. So we're working every day now with the Ohio Department of Transportation and the contractor, the contractors who will be involved in the rest restoration of our traffic management plan. Uh, working now on ironing out all the details and formalizing that plan, and we will keep you updated on that. Let me reiterate that my official order on traffic remains in effect. There's a single lane open on northbound I-71 and I-75 north of I-275. Let me say that again. There's a single lane open on the northbound I-71 and I-75 at I-275 for local passengers heading into downtown Covington via the 5th or 12th Street exits. That single lane can also be used by commercial vehicles that are making local deliveries. Let me say that again too. That single lane can be used by commercial vehicles that are making local deliveries. If they are not making local deliveries, they must take the detour onto I-275. Now, uh, before I wrap up, I wanna thank uh, all of our partners who have been involved in this project. I have a lot of people tell me that it's been done well, and we appreciate that. But again, we can't declare victory prematurely. We've still got 14 days to go here. But I wanna thank everyone who has been involved. Our team at the Transportation Cabinet in Frankfurt, in the central office, and also right here in District 6. I've said that there are literally hundreds of people both on the scene and behind the scenes that have been active in this repair project. The contractors, I wanna thank, contractors at every level, engineers at every level, who have kept this project on schedule and safe. We've said from the beginning that this bridge, the Brent Spence is safe, and sound and sturdy. It was before the crash and the fire. It will be again after the bridge is repaired, safe and sound and sturdy. 
I also want to thank local officials and law enforcement. So um, we have had incredible, incredible support by our local officials and law enforcement, all of our first responders, everyone who has helped us. I want to especially thank Kenton County for offering us their emergency operations center. I want to thank our federal partners at the Federal Highway Administration and the U.S. Department of Transportation. I really can't thank them enough because they came in right from the beginning. They helped us in bringing inspectors on site and they helped us with turning around of the emergency relief funding for the project. I also wanna thank local businesses and residents uh, for your support and for your patience. An example of this, an example, a wonderful example of this is Glears Gatta. You know, uh, many people in Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati, of course, know Glears. And they, they, provided, they provided lunches, not just for the emergency operations folks and for our first responders in the very first few days, but they came on site with a, with a food truck and they actually and fed the contractors in the second week of, of the work as it proceeded. So I just wanna, that, that's an example of the kind of support and encouragement that's been so inspiring in the project. So let me, in wrapping up, let me remind everyone that they can keep up with the progress on the project and the latest traffic information online at brentspencerepair.com. Be sure to also follow our KYTC District 6 Facebook and Twitter accounts. The bottom line is we will continue to work hard to get this vital transportation link reopened two weeks from today. And uh, Laura, so that, that's, uh, that brings us to our opportunity for some questions. And I said earlier, I've got Bob Yeager here with me who uh, will help us when we need it. So thanks so much. Okay, great. Uh, our first um, speaker is Courtney Francisco. And when you all um, want to speak, uh, I'll, um, unmute you and push the button to allow to talk. If you'd like to ask a question, be sure to raise your hand. And um, once you're ready to speak, please introduce yourself and your affiliation. Courtney, you are up. Thank you, Secretary Gray. I just wanted to, maybe this is technical, but how cold is too cold for concrete and would you need heaters? Well, there's no exact, no, there's no exact number on that, but we are in plenty good shape for it. at 48 degrees today, we're in good shape. Now the contractor has made provisions if it gets, if it gets colder and su substantially colder, then they will be able to, uh, they would be able to both provide an accelerator, uh, which would uh, encourage a uh, accelerating in the curing of the concrete, but also uh, a heating space below the deck uh, has, been, has been planned for. And so plenty of plans for uh, heating the concrete should we need it. But, you know, knock on wood, right now we're in good shape. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, next we have um, James Pilcher. Uh, go ahead. Jay, um, I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't see the sign to unmute. There you go. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, sir. Good afternoon, we can. Secretary. Data yeah. from the uh, data from the Kentucky uh, um, Highway Patrol indicates that accidents as a whole and accidents involving commercial vehicles on the bridge have been on the rise over the last five years. They hit an all-time high last month, last year, and they were even with the slowdown, um, looking like they were going to do it again this year. Once the bridge is open, what what apart from building a new bridge, what other mitigating things can the transportation department do to lower accidents on the bridge? I know the bridge is sturdy, but as you know, it's functionally obsolete and it's a traffic hazard. Well, as you know, Jim, uh, the, the the bridge itself was the lane capacity was added to four lanes from three, and that's been a number of years ago. I've said from the from the beginning when the event occurred and it was that the issues associated with the Brent Spence Bridge 
have never been about its condition. It's been about its, the issues have been about its capacity. And I don't see that any of that's going away. Uh, the conversation and the plans have been about a Western companion bridge. And, uh, and that's, that's, his, that, that's arguably the best solution, clearly. Now I'm gonna let Bob Yeager, Bob, if you have something to add to Yep, I'm gonna let Bob add to it, Jim. He's boots on the ground here. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And, and, and to those of us who uh, drive the bridge every day, it's no surprise that accidents are increasing on there. And we're always looking for great, great ways to, uh, to help us fix that. And one of the things we're doing um, is uh, uh, we have a plan to do what we're calling a Texas turnaround. Um, this, uh, this plan will, will allow us to, to extend the uh, four lanes that are currently on the bridge back to the Pike Street entrance. Um, that will allow a greater flexibility for people on the bridge uh, maneuvering those that are in the wrong lane and want to go 71 or those that are in, in the uh, right lane uh, in the, one of the right lanes want to go on 75 giving them an extra few thousand feet to make those decisions. Um, with that, we're also looking at the, the things that we've done. Uh, you know, uh, farther, a little farther south, uh, we've just completely redone that, uh, that thing just above the cut in the hill. Uh, we were having experiencing a lot of accidents there as well. And we've done some things there. So every, every one of these things, we're looking at the safety. Um, we're, we're, we're putting together as many uh, different things as we can. I think uh, once, we get the, uh, once we get that in, in place, uh, we'll have that done. Um, we're still going to experience a, a little headache, of course, with the, uh, with the Brent Spence next year uh, when we intend to paint it. Uh, and we'll be looking at safety factors there and, and what we can do with the trucks uh, during that construction as well. So I think if there are some benefits to the things that have happened over the last uh, uh, six, eight weeks, um, it has been that uh, we certainly wanted to take a, a greater concentrated look at the, how we get the traffic through there safely. Yeah, but Jim, I, I, and everything that uh, Bob added, of course, is accurate and it's, uh, and it's timely. Uh, but I would say from the experience that I've had here in the last month uh, that, you know, there's the old, af the old adage, old saying that relief is just a minute away. Uh, relief is more than a minute away here. Uh, we've got 160,000 uh, vehicles a day traveling over the Brent Spence existing Brent Spence Bridge, and it was designed to accommodate 80,000, uh, 70 to 80,000. So that tells you right there that, that uh, the, the improvements that Bob's describing are improvements that will be, uh, be, make modest improvements, but the significant improvements are gonna occur with that companion bridge model. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, we have um, Tom Latek from uh, Kentucky Today, and I, you should be able to unmute yourself at this point. And I have, thank you very much. Jim, hello once again. Um, earlier, I remember you saying that uh, you had the $12 million commitment from the federal government for the repairs on this, and that it was what, 3.6 million, I believe, for the repairs so far. Um, is that figure still standing up or is there additional cost now? I'm sorry, I was having a little bit of technical problems in hearing the question, but I think it was related to the uh, the 12 million that we of emergency relief, the the what called the 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 down payment that occurred first, and uh, the the uh, cost to date, uh, and the cost to date, the the construction repair contract itself was roughly 3.1 million. That's the contract with Kokosing. That's been the so that's been a substantial cost, of course, but there are other costs associated with the project, uh, costs for engineering, costs for inspection. So altogether, uh, we're looking at that $12 million number at this point in time um, as, a, as a number that gets us, gets us to where the substantial portion of the project is, uh, is complete. But we've got I failed to mention traffic management costs. So there's a number of costs on top of the, just the construction costs itself. Okay, so you figure the it could be, of the be beam, more than 12? Uh, at this point in time, I'm, it's premature for me to say. 
Okay, thanks, Jim. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Uh, next, we have Tana Weingartner from WVXU. Hi, okay, thank you, Tana Weingartner, WVXU. So Tom asked my first question about the money. Um, and then my other go-to question for you is just how's the crash investigation going and do we have a cause yet? Thank you. Yeah, investigation is still underway. Uh, we, and, and so the, uh, the significant outcomes of it or the report is, uh, is yet to come. Any idea on the timeline on that? Uh, you know, that's something that, uh, that we can ask and get back to you on. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Tana. Um, right now, we don't have any more hands. If there's any other questions, uh, please raise your hand now. Otherwise, we will say goodbye for today. Oh, we do have a hand. Molly Lair. Go ahead. Hi, Hi Molly Lair with WLWT um, News 5. Just wondering when it comes to the traffic enforcement, you know, anyone who's been driving in the area knows there are still those drivers who are not following the current order in place, how the enforcement is going and if you have an idea of how many, if any, citations have been issued for disobeying that order. Of course, my official order allowed for uh, local law enforcement to use their citation authority. Um, at, at this point in time, I'm not certain of how much that authority has been employed uh, or the numbers, um, but we will look into it and we'll get that number back to you. Unless Bob, do you know? No, we don't have that number right now. Thank you. We'll get back to you on it though. Okay, okay is that it? Uh, that is it for today. Okay, Laura. Well, thanks. And thanks everybody who joined us today. Really appreciate it. We'll keep you updated. Thank you.